Hi guys, uh, welcome back to the channel. This is the second video that I'm making. Uh, I'm going to show a little bit more about some coils, specifically adjusting the points for proper current draw. I'd like to thank everybody who subscribed as a result of watching that first video where I fixed Musty One's coil for his Marine two cycle engine. I appreciate the shout out from him and I appreciate everybody who subscribed to my channel because of watching that video and posting comments. It means a lot. I'm trying to build the YouTube channel a little bit. I've got a lot of interesting little projects going on. If uh, there's a desire to do that and watch the work that I'm doing, I'll be happy to continue to make videos. Anyway, today's video is going to be specifically how to set the points for proper current draw on one of these buzz coils. Now they're not, it's not identical to the musky coil. Here's a Model T coil and you can see that you have the, in this case this has been modified for from the button type to thumb screw type whereas this only has the thumb screws. The operation is the same, a set of vibrating points at the top with an electromagnet running down the middle. You have a plug output, in this case this terminal's the plug. On the coil in question, this terminal's the plug. You have a common point, which is this terminal or this terminal on this particular coil. And then you have power or the battery, which on the Model T is on the bottom. And up on the, co the coil in question, here's the top. Um, I use these coils on two cycle motor car engines. We run on the railroad, otherwise known as rail speeders. If you look at any of my other videos, you'll see other videos that I've made with those rail speeders in operation. So with that, I'm going to go over a few steps on uh, how to adjust them. First, we're going to go over a short overview of how the coil operates. Okay, this is going to be handheld. Hopefully you'll be able to see it okay. This is a uh, print. I did not draw this. This came out of, I don't even remember where it came from initially. Uh, I pulled it off the net. And this shows the inside of a coil. Um, you can refer to the other video for what we're looking at. You've got the wooden box out here. I've identified this as the spark terminal. Again, this is a Model T coil. Other buzz coils are set up very similar. This is the common side. And then down on the bottom is the battery or power going in. And again, if you recall, I mentioned that you could reverse these back and forth. The output doesn't care um, polarity wise because the current will flow in either direction. You've got a glass insulator or separator over on this side. That's a big piece of glass. And then you have the old condenser that sat along in here. And again, if you saw that first video, I showed you examples of both of them. The wiring goes like this. You've got the power coming in, the core down the center, that's the primary. That's the primary coil. Um, and that receives the inputted voltage, 6, 12, up to, I believe, 24 volts out of a Model T Magneto. Um, power goes through, comes back out, comes over to the capacitor. There is a common connection between the bottom end of the capacitor and what is the stationary bridge point at the top. The other end of the capacitor comes up and goes to one side of the movable point. This is the movable point. These are actually the points that, that uh, open and close. And then you also have the common side coming across and coming over again to this movable point. So there is no interconnection between this wire and this wire. It's just the way it's drawn. So what you have is you have basically you have a transformer, although it's not a transformer because we're not dealing with alternating current, but you have a current buildup, a, ma a magnetic field that builds up in this primary when the points are closed. That completes the circuit. When the points open, that circuit, the magnetic field collapses, and the, the magnetic field that was in the secondary coil then fires. And that's all relative to the number of windings on the primary coil and the number of windings on the secondary coil. The primary coil windings are a much thicker wire 
than the secondary coil windings. And maybe we'll take a break and take a look at that. Um, hang on. Okay, so here's, here's a coil from, uh, from the, excuse me. This is a primary coil and secondary coil assembly out of a hit and miss coil or a buzz coil. You can see the center core. Here's the, the size of the wire that comes up through. Uh, it looks like to be about maybe a 14 or a 16 solid. It's varnished, it's insulated. And then here's the, here's the two secondary wires. This little tiny wire coming out over here and this other little tiny wire coming out over here. This particular uh, coil is from a Pontiac coil used in rail motor cars. But that gives you an idea of what's actually inside. You can see the, the um, pieces of iron going down the middle. That's the iron core or the electromagnet. So that, that shows you what it looks like on the inside. Okay, so we're back. Let's go through one more time what we're looking at. You've got the points, the movable point, the upper bridge. This is, I'm going to refer to this as the vibrator leaf. I'm going to refer to this point running across the top as the upper bridge. I'm going to refer to this point down here as the movable point. We've got the iron core running down the center. You've got the secondary, which consists of two separate coils. They are connected together. You've got this glass insulator. Now, I remove the glass insulator when I rebuild the motor car or the uh, Model T coils. Uh, you don't need it. You have to be able to fit the new capacitor or condenser down in this side. Sometimes you take them out, sometimes you don't. I generally take them out uh, just to be able to get to the wires better to be able, because there's tar and all kinds of muck and nonsense in here. And then this is the old style condenser. And obviously, you've got the wooden box. And again, this Model T style has these plugs on the end, um, these, these button contacts. So uh, let's move on and let me show you what, what I want to do today is I want to take a coil that came with a motor car that I purchased in December and we're going to pull all the hardware off the top and I'm going to show you how to set it up for the proper current draw. So we're back at it. Um, this is the coil in question. Again, it's used in motor cars. This particular kind of coil has a removable back. You can see that there's six screws on this particular coil, whereas on a Model T coil, you can slide out the plate to get in, or the, the, the other side of the box to be able to get in there and change the capacitor. On these coils, it's good to uh, remove the back to do the, po the points adjustment. The reason for that is, and you'll see, you'll be able to tap the points up and down to adjust the current draw. We'll show that a little bit later. So six little wooden screws, the brass, uh, they pull off the, the back of these coils. These coils were designed to operate in a, they're specifically built and designed to operate in a motor car environment. There's actually a coil box that had batteries in it. They used to use four little dry cell batteries um, sure very few people know what I'm referring to. Here's the inside of the back. There's a little bit of tar uh, attached to it. Normally when you can see a coil that's been overheated you'll see the pock marks in the tar. Uh, there's no pock marks on this. I don't know about the condenser in here. I've, I have tried this coil. This coil was in the motor car that you'll see a little bit later on and you saw in the other video. And this, this coil operated in the condition that it's in uh, at that time. So I, I suspect that there's probably nothing really wrong with this coil other than being out of adjustment. So we've got the bridge, we've got the movable point, uh, we've got the lock nut for the bridge, and then the adjusting nut for the bridge. So let's take the lock nut off. The lock nuts on this are, uh, I use a 8 millimeter socket to take that off. Most of the coils that you see nowadays utilize a nylock or nylon insert nut for the top. I prefer this nut. You only have one adjustment and you don't have to worry about a lock nut. Um, this is the way the coil came to me, so we're just going to continue to use it. Anyway, then we take off the main nut and 
just backs off. I keep all the hardware in the same location. There's a paper or fiber washer. That's a holdover from the old days uh, when the tops of these coils were metal and they specifically wanted to have an insulation between the uh, top of the coil and any of the movable points for electrical reasons. Next we remove the two nuts that hold on this upper bridge. And then the upper bridge comes off. There's another fiber washer. Usually it's slightly domed from sitting on top of the spring. This stud is not electrically connected to anything inside the coil. Uh, oftentimes I'll take a wrench and tighten this jam nut on the top. This is merely to, to, use to, to be used to adjust the location of the bridge relative to the movable point. There's two additional nuts in the back that hold the movable point in position, and we take them out, take them off. Off comes the movable point, and then there's two little spacers to hold up the, the bridge. And that's it. Now it's stripped down. You can see here's the electromagnet or the iron core. And then you've got the way the, remember from that drawing how this is wired together. So these make the electrical contact. All your electric for the vibrating points occurs in the back. So these points are slightly pitted. I'm not sure whether I'm going to reuse them or uh, put new ones on. I think I'm going to try and clean them up. I usually take a small piece of 220. Uh, and just slightly polish them. Again, these pits are, are fairly deep, but let me see what I can do to get these up to snuff. Just again, slightly back and forth. Some guys use a points file. I prefer to use the, the 220. I can keep the bridge or the point parallel with the top of the workbench to get it perfectly square. So, okay, we're back. I stripped the points off. I'm not happy with them. They're going to need to be dressed more if I can even reuse them. Those pits are deeper than I thought they were, particularly on this upper bridge. So, I brought out a new set of points. They came out of a bag. That was the old number from Fairmont. Um, they're just KW points. You can buy them from Model T suppliers. This particular point has, um, from the factory, it has the correct gap up on the top. It should have about five thousandths between this, this little vibrating leaf and the upper bridge. And then this bottom one, there's no movement between the actual point arm, which is spring steel and the aluminum base. There is a little bit of oxidation on it. I'll just give it a slight little polish, just enough to clean it. That's all, it, that's all it needs. So they fit and they fit fine. Again, this, these are all standardized parts. Back in with the nuts. polish on the upper bridge. It won't hurt it. And just enough to take the oxidation off. You're not looking to grind the points down or anything else like that. Fiber washer in place with the spring. Upper bridge goes on. Two nuts that hold the upper bridge into position go on. Sometimes the holes that are drilled in these are not drilled accurately. And that's why you sometimes have to ream the uh, aluminum holes in that lower vibrating leaf, that movable, leaf, that movable point, excuse me, the vibrating leaves on the upper one. Put the other fiber washer back on and the large adjusting nut. The little nut's the lock nut for this. So let's, okay, yeah, that's way better, way better. I don't know if you can see it but they're lined up perfectly. 
So, and then you can you can see how I adjust back and forth slightly to get to get them lined up perfectly. I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to draw these, just slide these down a little bit. These lock nuts, these nuts by hand. You can see just that little bit moves it until they're they're seeing exactly as square as they can get. And again, you want to sneak up on this. You want them to line up perfectly, as best you possibly can. And again, I check them. I check them by eye and by feel. And they are perfect. Let's tighten these up as tight as we can get them. Again, you're making this electrical connection now. Let's see. Now it did move. It slid, slid this way as the nuts were being drawn up tight. And it's enough that I would like to readjust it. So bring it back. And you can sneak up on this. I'm holding this in position because I know when it's tightened, it will draw it past it. We're good. We're good. Yep, we're good. So now what we want to do is we want to set the gap that's that's on the top. Now the Fairmont manual and the Model T, they go, you know, it's in 30 seconds of an inch. And I believe it's a 30 second is what it's supposed to be. I just use a 30 thousandths feeler gauge close enough. They were dealing in inches, fractions of an inch. 30 thousandths worked perfectly for me. 30 thousandths feeler gauge. Come down and I, I do it the way the Model T method is. The, Mo the Model T method is stated in the old manual. The Fairmont method says you should have 30 thousandths gap underneath this, the movable point between the movable point and the iron core. I personally think that's not correct because that's not taking into account whatever diff distance you have or difference you have in this upper, in the leaf, the vibrating leaf that's connected to the bridge, the upper bridge, and this lower, this lower mobile point. I prefer to measure it at this location with this held down square onto the upper, excuse me, yeah, the upper end of the iron core. I got no drag there, so I run the adjustment nut down. And again, I'm, I'm checking this. And we've got just 30 there, maybe a hair more. And the way to really see it is you're not feeling for drag. You're looking at that upper leaf, if there's any movement in that upper leaf when you insert this feeler gauge. And I'm, when, I, when I insert it, I see nothing. When I move it, it moves up just slightly. So. I'm good there at 30 thousandths. Ideally, you should lock this down. I'm just going to put this into position. I know I'm going to need to lock it later, but a lot of the other a lot of the other coils have like on this junky coil. This is a nylock or a, a nylon insert nut. They, they've done away with this lock nut on the top. I prefer these. You only have one nut to adjust. You don't have to worry about making minor adjustments when you tighten a jam nut or lock nut down on the upper nut. But we're dealing with what's came with this coil and I'm going to keep it the same. So everything's tight. Just go through, double check it. And now I'm going to take a break and I'm going to set up to test this with the battery. Okay, we're back. Uh, went and got my spark plug, my test plug. I also have a regular D16. That's what we run in most of the Fairmont proprietary motors, the bell car. My six volt battery, a bunch of jumper leads. The connections for the jumper leads are as follows. 
And again, this is for this particular coil, but they can be used. The, the connections are the same, just depends on where you're at on the, on, on the Model T coil. Model T coil plug, common, battery. On the Fairmont coil, plug, common, battery. So, we take the, the plug, I, I have some heavier wire, I disconnect the screw-on terminal for a quick, quick clamp or boot, and then I hook it up onto the output from the coil. And then take another common, you see I didn't make any arrangements with this, I just yanked all this stuff out of my toolbox. And you want to, for sure you want to separate these two because they will, they will arc to each other if they're close enough. This is not cooperating. Hey, it's a YouTube video. Connect it. We can connect it right up on the point if we wanted to. I just want, I want you to see the spark more than anything. And we take another wire, another jumper. We jump from the common. I'm going to jump over to the negative of the battery. Yes, I'm using the red wire to the negative. Who cares? And then I'm going to use another wire. From the pot, from the battery terminal on the coil, down to the hot of the battery deposit. And let's see what happens. Okay, we're getting spark. Very little arcing up at the top. And then it's probably pretty decent in there. So we got a spark. Seems my camera has a tendency to, to tone down the noise. I'm not sure how this is going to come out. So let me hit. hit let me, let me connect the meter in series, and then we can see what kind of current's being drawn on here. Hang on a second. Okay. Okay, I have my meter. I'm using a Simpson 260 analog meter. This is a 260 series seven. I was fortunate that someone gave this to me. Nice meter. You're going to need an analog meter to set this digital meter. There's too much variation in the voltage because of the vibration. The analog meter dampens that out completely. I have it. This, this meter is good for up to 10 amps. I've got the positive side connected in series to the positive side of the terminal. And I have the negative 10 amp connected to the battery post up on the coil. So let's hook it up and see where we're at. Okay, you can see that that, if you can see this carefully, we're up on the 10, 10 scale. It's drawing just about 2 amps. What we want to do is we want to cut that wall down. We want to be around, around an amp. So there's a couple of different ways of doing this. I knew from the beginning that this upper point seemed a little, uh, there was a little too much tension on here. And the way to adjust it is up on this upper side. And you've got, I use a pin punch, and you, and you have variation up here based on relative to where this lower vibrating leaf is bolted to the top of the coil. So what I'm going to do is to decrease the current draw, you push down this side. I usually tap on the, tap on the rivet. Just give it a couple taps at first. You want to kind of get it close to an amp, and then we can, we can fine adjust it while the coil is actually operating. Again, I'm not sure whether you're going to hear me. Now you can see that that's barely, just those three taps, now it's barely producing a spark. So then I go back over here and I put a little bit more tension on that lower leaf. Let's see where we're at. That's not bad. We're going right around one amp and that's where we're at. We're just a hair over one amp. You can see on the top that there's very little arcing between there. You can see also that we're not getting a real good spark. So in this case, I'm just going to tap on it just a hair more. 
just to bring it up, bring the current draw up a little. Now I'm drawing just below 1.2 amps, I'm getting a good spark all the time, you can see that. It's right around 1.2 amps. And again, it's sparking really nice on that spark plug tester. And then you can, it hits every time. So I'm, I'm real happy with that. I would pronounce that this coil is good, at least for now. Again, I don't know about the capacitor. It's not a fountain of sparks. I suspect that capacitor is probably leaky. It might have some moisture in it. It's probably worth the change, but for now, the coil is functioning, it's functioning well. We're good to go. I would use this coil on my own motor car. Take a break. Eh, you know what? I'm just going to put this right back on the D16. Again, the reason that you have this jump, that you, you want to see that this, the, the, the uh, spark will jump from the electrode to the ground side, is the, the intensity, the amount of power that the coil is going to need to create a spark in compression with fuel and oil, particularly, particularly the oil, under compression when the engine's up on top dead center or darn close to it, the oil, the high pressure, and the gas all act as insulators. So you want to be able to bridge that gap. Guaranteed this thing's going to spark like crazy with, with just this little, with just this little 30 thousandths gap on, on the, uh, on the plug as I'm connecting it. It's really not going to, it's not going to affect it. It'll, it'll sound nicer and it'll, it'll run better. The coil will operate better. Yes, I'm struggling to connect that ground up. And again, you can even hear the difference in the coil operating. But we are getting a good spark. Coil's working good. Very, very little arcing up on the top. Again, I'm going to use this coil in the motor car. So we're drawing right around, right around an amp. One, one amp between one amp and 1.2 amps uh, on six volts. The higher the voltage, the less the amperage. So, let's take a break. I'm going to show you a few other things. Okay, we're back. Um, as I said, if anybody looked at some of the other videos on my channel, there's a video entitled Bringing Rail Speeder Back to Life. This is a motor car rail speeder. This car is right in the middle of being rewired. The wiring on this car was an absolute mess. Uh, and if you, if you know anything about mechanics or motor cars, you could see that when I had it running, I had a ground jumpered out. Uh, it, the ignition system did work, but most of the lights didn't. Uh, I've converted this to 12 volts. There's the alternator. This arrangement is very different from most other motor cars. Most other motor cars, the generator, the alternator is mounted on the engine and then is belt driven off the engine all in one unit. This is an MR19. Hang on a second, let me show you something. The reason it's called an MR is because there's actually two drive belts. You've got the inner drive belt that runs back to a gearbox and then you've got the outer drive belt that runs back to the axle. And so when the engine is spinning, is running in a forward direction, when the flywheels are going forward, the forward belt spins the axle in the same direction. The reverse belt spins this gearbox in a forward direction, but it's a, it's, there's no reduction in the gearing. So the gear is going forward, and then the gear that's on the axle goes in reverse. So this is an MR19 for the R being a reversible. There's the alternator. That's off a Toyota forklift. Uh, I have not run this car yet. I've not run the engine with that alternator in, in the current position that it's in. Uh, I'm hoping that it's gonna work. I will show a video whether it does or it does not. Right now, you can see the switches are laid out. The ammeter's laying face down. 
Uh, I have all the wiring run back. Sorry about that, the battery died. Um, battery in this camera is getting old. I did buy a replacement battery. So where I was at was, I'm gonna show you this car once the, once the wiring's finished. And uh, however it works, it works. Uh, you can see the nest of wires. Let me show you a few other things. I've opted to go with a larger seal lead acid battery in here. I believe this is a 20 amp hour battery. It does fit in the Fairmont toolbox, as you can see. And then over on this side, this box is gonna be where the coil is gonna reside. Here's the front end of the engine. And again, if you watch that other video, you'll see this in action. So let me show you a few other things. Okay, so here's a little bit of the collection. You've got a car right here. This is an MR19, excuse me, an M19AA. This has a two-cylinder engine on it. They fire simultaneously. This car runs. I had the top off. There's the windshield in the back. There's some aluminum sheeting. I need to make a piece for this front. It's one of these multi-year projects that I'm ready to do it and, and then something else pops up. This car is also being converted to 12 volts. This is a go-to car that I run often. This is an M9. Car weighs 840 pounds as you see it. Very light. It's the smallest style motor car that Fairmont made. Had this engine apart. Uh, this, this block is bored 40 thousandths over. That's the maximum you can go here in the States. Um, and uh, what's funny about this, this particular engine was when we pulled it apart, the rings that were on the piston were standard rings. They weren't 40 over rings and the engine still ran. So there was a nice big gap in those rings. I did put the correct rings back in it. We put new bearings on it. This thing runs like a champ. Uh, again, it's my go-to car. It's a CN car and it had Trainmaster on it. I talked to a guy that knew this car when it had first come off the uh, Canadian National Railroad and he said that's the way it came. That's a long-term project. That's an ST2 with a big RQ single on it. That's a bigger engine. We'll talk about them in another video. And this is my other go-to car. This is a CR7. Uh, that engine's been completely rebuilt. I uh, poured that 20 over, new piston, all new uh, bearings in it, rewire, thing runs like a champ. Um, this car is not a fast car. The most you can get out of this car is about 33, 34, maybe 35 going downhill. It's designed more for a light section work. It's not really an inspection car. It's another little M9 sitting over on that side. Uh, that M9 shows up in one of the videos. I think it's Rail Speeder in the November Sun. So with that, guys, a little brief overview. I've got a number of projects that I'm working on. Uh, if there's interest, I will make videos of them too. If not, then who knows where we'll go. Thanks again for subscribing. Thanks for making comments. Uh, I do read all the comments. I reply to some of them. I will warn people, watch what other people post. I'm not really going to delete comments. I don't feel as though I need to be a censor or the internet police. Um, some people like to spout off that they're experts at everything. What I show in my videos is procedures, products, and practices that work for me. They may not work for you. I've got 30 plus years in in the motor car hobby, plus I operated motor cars even before then, outside of the hobby. And I've been working on railroads since 1976, so I've got a little bit of experience. Anyway, thanks again, guys, for sticking in, and we'll see you on the next one.